All right. Oh, okay. It's 3 p.m. where you are, right? <laughs> okay. Welcome to the ninth day of the Days of Miracles. We're moving along in the new year quickly. And we are so very honored and happy to uh, welcome today Geshe Kausam Wangbo uh, to the Days of Miracles. And so those of you who don't know Geshe-la, uh, Geshe comes from Germany and met quite when she was quite young in her very early 20s. Uh, she got stuck during her travels here in Damshala, I believe, and entered pretty much straight away a 17-year Geshe program and uh, was awarded the Geshe degree as a first woman Yeah, in 2011. And uh, now the I shouldn't say that, but it's like it is. Uh, many of the Tibetan, uh, you know, nuns also since 2016, I believe, uh, also became or uh, were granted the Geshe degree. So, uh, but uh, Geshe La is still the only Western female Geshe, so to say. And we are so happy and honored to have her here. Geshe La has helped Tushita in so, so many ways. In the last 20 years, it's, uh, yeah, mind boggling. Without her, Tushita would not be what it is so uh, if it's translating for the lamas or uh, leading courses here or um, so many different things uh, thank you so much geshe -la, um for uh, on this beautiful sunday well in mm -hmm. germany it's uh, just before lunchtime in india afternoon thank you so much for joining us and we made it a question and answer session so please have your questions ready thank you so much geshe -la. okay thank you Kumbilla. All right, so let's start right away, but let's start with the spool meditation just to uh, set our motivation to be ready for this. So make sure you're comfortable. Focus on your breath for a few moments. Just be mindful. Breathing in and breathing out. And then let's think that there's so much suffering in this world. The form of conflicts and wars and personal problems and difficulties. So may we take this as a, may this become a cause for all of us here getting together to learn about ourselves, our mind, as a step towards transforming our thoughts, reducing our afflictions, and replacing them with generosity, patience, compassion and love. And of course, eventually to actualize our fullest potential in the form of reaching the awakened state of a Buddha. So with this motivation, let's start the session.
All right. So if you'd like to ask a question, let me just make sure I can see all of you, which somehow doesn't work. All right, please, if you want to raise your, uh, what's it called, virtual hand, that may be easiest. Who's fast? Anyone? And of course, you're welcome to ask any question. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll ask you a question. I'll just choose someone. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. go ahead. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, I would like to ask uh, a question about uh, eighth consciousness. Okay. Um, uh, I don't really know much about it, but uh, as far as I know, um, mm -hmm. it's from the Mandalay School, and then it talks about it's Alaya or the storage mm -hmm. in our mind, mm -hmm. and um, it, it is discussed in Mandalay School, but I I I I believe in middle way school right mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we do not accept its existence or it doesn't uh, it that it doesn't accept it mm -hmm. but then for someone like me who didn't directly realize this ultimate truth and uh this i'm kind of far from this middle way school uh, uh, acceptance mm -hmm. and there must be a way for one to understand how our mind functions right mm -hmm. and i i'm just wondering i i would like to understand a little bit more about how the the karmic effect and how our mind is kind of storing all these things in our mind mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, how, how this eighth consciousness is related to the karma, our memory, our habitual tendencies and so forth. And um, I am kind of doing this Vajra Sattva practice and I, in relation to this practice, um, this question that I have, I mm -hmm. also like, like to know about purification of our defilements and so forth with um, these practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, defilements and negativities, I kind of feel like it's kind of our karma or, you know, our tendencies that was stored in our mind, in our eighth mm -hmm. consciousness and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, it's in my mind, I, it's very difficult for me to accept that, like, um, Doing a practice will just purify everything, like purify all this karmic <laughs> uh, mm. imprint and so forth. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. in in our kind of devotional level, I'm like praying to, you know, the Buddha and so forth. Devotional level, I kind of I feel very devotional, but mm -hmm. in my mind, it's I'm still kind of struggling to understand how this purification mm -hmm. takes place and how okay. this eight consciousness work. So I'm sorry, it's a long question. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. All right. I'll try to answer it. Uh, if I forget something, please let me know. Well, first of all, this eight consciousnesses, well, as you said, this is according to the mind-only school, the yoga chaya, as it's also called, or, or mind-only, or yoga chaya, or yoga. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, mind-only school, or chitta matra is really the Sanskrit term. Um, which is not the highest school, but it's really helpful to learn the ideas of this school, which very much puts the emphasis on the mind. Well, the word, the, the name of the school, mind only, already implies that it's very much about the mind, which is quite interesting because the schools that are below, if you like, so there are four schools, as you're probably aware. There's there are the two um, Vaibhashika and Satantrika, those two schools, and they very much talk about things exist out there in the world objectively just as we perceive them. Of course, they teach more than that, but the emphasis in comparison to the Chitta Matra school is very much, well, objectively there's this world over there, the way we perceive it. And then the Chitta Matra school comes in and tells us everything is just in the mind. There's just mind. There's nothing out there. It's quite interesting. 
it, it goes from one extreme to another. And then once you study the Chitta Matra school, you usually then study the middle way school where you kind of find that balance. Everything is out there. Nothing is out there. Well, the mind is important, yes, but very much important. And things couldn't exist without the mind, but there's still an external world. So having said this, in the Chitta Matra school, in the mind only school, they speak about eight consciousnesses. Not in not all the proponents of the Chitta Matra school follow this view of eight consciousnesses. There are actually there's a there are two categories of the Chitta Matra school. So only one category, uh, the ones following scripture, as they're called. You have the ones following reasoning and the ones following scripture. So anyway, it's just those following scripture who assert eight consciousnesses. And yes, why Why do they explain eight consciousnesses, although they're not explained in the higher schools? Well, simply because it explains how karma, how karmic imprints are passed on from one life to the next. Because that's very difficult to, to understand. It's extremely difficult. And so sometimes learning these lower schools, they provide us almost like with training wheels. You know, like when you ride a bicycle, you've initially used training wheels, which help you to learn to ride a bike and eventually you remove them. So many of the lower schools, they provide ideas that once you move to the higher schools as part of your your study of philosophy, we don't need these training wheels. You can understand ideas such as karma without accepting an eighth consciousness. All right. But still, it, it's, it's got a, an important place. And therefore, we learn about this. So this idea, yes, that there's, of course, there are the five sense consciousnesses, six, five sense consciousnesses. And then there is... Uh, the the afflicted mind as it's called and the oh sorry i forgot the mental consciousness so the five sense consciousnesses the mental consciousness so the six consciousnesses as we usually know them and then they add an afflicted consciousness and the alavishnaya or the the eighth consciousness which is called the uh the mind, the mind basis of wool. In English, it's translated as mind basis of wool, which is really just another way of saying it is the basis for all the imprints left on our mind, which becomes extremely important in a system, a philosophical system that doesn't accept the existence of anything out there. So that on top of karmic kind of residues, if you like, karmic imprints, as they're called, that are left on the mind. You also have imprints left on the mind uh, whenever you have the perception of something. And because of this imprint left, you'll have a further perception of something similar in the future. So if you have no external world, how come things appear to us? Well, it's due to the imprints left in the mind just like when we sleep, for instance, we we have certain ideas and thoughts and they they arise, certain things appear to the mind, form, color, shape, and so forth, that arise because of what was left in the mind while we're awake. Okay, so now the same here when we're asleep, um, imprints were left and so we have these different appearances. Okay. And they're not exactly the same as what happened in the during the waking time, but still it kind of reflects that. So similarly, if you have no time when there's when there's no external world as such, how do you explain the appearance of things? And so this for this you very much need the eighth consciousness, which is the storehouse of all these imprints. And then of course you have karmic imprints, an action of the body, speech, and mind. They don't go. They 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 don't just arise and then disappear without anything left. There's a residue. There's always something left on our mind. Volitional actions of the body, volitional actions of the speech, and of course thoughts we have. So all these are left on the mental on the on the uh, eighth consciousness, the store storage consciousness, and then you have to you carry them on to the next life. It's not like they get lost. And that's why it's so helpful to think of this eighth consciousness of this idea that 
these imprints, these residues, whatever you want to call them, from all our actions of body, speech, and mind, they are stored there. And they continue on to the next life. So that's why it's very helpful to learn more about them. They're stored in there. It's a neutral mind. That's very important. Because the difficulty really is to explain if a mind becomes virtuous, how could you have non-virtuous imprints left on it? Or if a mind is non-virtuous, how could you have virtuous imprints left on it? So that becomes a little difficult for the other schools, especially the higher school, to explain. And as it's like a train training wheel, just for the time being, since it's hard to grasp, well, do you have the explanation of this eighth consciousness that is neutral, doesn't do very much except holding on to, I mean, things appear to it, but it doesn't, it's not a, a, a cognizing mind. It's not a realizing mind. It's this neutral mind that basically stores all our, all the residues from our experiences, from our karmic actions and so forth. So if you think along those lines, and then of course there's more detailed explanations, but it basically comes down to that. Okay. So, and then when, when the circumstances are ripe, things ripen in our mind, you know, certain thoughts, certain things appearing to the mind due to the ripening of other imprints, then a karmic imprint may ripen and lead to the, the, the different experiences we have. So that's the explanation uh, given from the point of view of the Chitta Mantra school following scripture. Now, as to your question, how do we purify these residues left on our mind? Well, yeah, it's really difficult to, to grasp. I, I totally get it. Like sitting down and doing some, you know, some action that may actually feel comfortable. You're comfortable on your seat. Okay, if it's frustrations that you use as a, as a tool to, to purify, it may not feel that uh, comfortable. But reciting a mantra maybe actually, you know, quite pleasant, you feel calm, etc. So it's like a pleasant experience such as that may actually purify horrible actions I've accumulated in the past. All right, so that thought may arise. Um, but what is important to understand that here we utilize the power of our own mind. What was it that left these karmic imprints? Our own mind. No one put them there. It was not like, uh, I don't know, I stole, I killed, and then someone took like a, a handful of imprints and basically stuck them onto my mind. Now, of course, that didn't happen. What happened was, well, I accumulated an action. I did something, volitional action, and something was left on my mind. Okay. So that being the case, therefore, it's only my own mind that can remove them. It's only me that can do something about it. But of course, it's not enough to recite a mantra. You need the four powers, as you're aware, the four powers. So one of them is remorse. Right? Just, oh, I shouldn't have done this. And even if I don't remember the action, but just thinking, whatever I've done, whatever I've done in the past that harmed others, I, I'm so sorry for that. I mean, even just that, even just that. And I mean, it makes just in common sense. If you if you're with another person, you've you've spent with them many years and you've done things to them, you don't even remember, but you say, Look, I apologize from the depth of my heart. What I've done was wrong. I'm so sorry. Makes a whole difference to your relationship. Legally, if you show regret well, your sentence is probably going to be lighter. So the point is, it's common sense that just regret already does something to the imprints. And then, of course, the power of resolve. I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to try my very best. So I'm going to keep to the 10 virtues. And so basically, directly or indirectly, they, they include all the negative actions, or I may give, go further than that. I'm not going to beat anyone up. I'm not going to, uh, whatever other action is not part of the, the 10, uh, 10 non-virtues. So any harmful action, I'm just going to refrain from that. I'll give my best. And then 
Having done that, then you engage in the action as well. You take a virtuous object and engage in the action, right? So purification. It doesn't have to be reciting mantras. Uh, it could also be your job, for instance, if you work as a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, like positive actions, working for the benefit of sentient beings. And even reciting a mantra, well, how, how long is it comfortable? Five minutes, 10 minutes? We're not used to sitting for that long. And then visualizing this white stream, Vajrasattva you mentioned, but Vajrasattva, so purifying all this. So the motivation, of course, is for the benefit of other sentient beings. That, again, gives our mind a special kind of power, if you like, or a special ability. It it it's much more effective for that motivation to purify things. So I don't know how much we purify. No one really will, unless someone has clairvoyant powers or omniscience. Um, they wouldn't know, of course. And it just, it, it all depends how strong our remorse is, how strong our resolve is, how focused we are. And of course, it's not going to get rid of everything. <laughs> that would be too easy. Um, it's it's a process that needs to be repeated. And if we can make the time, we should do it every night, at least 21 times, because it said that that takes care of the non-virtues accumulated throughout that day. At least it keeps them from magnifying, from growing bigger, as you probably heard, like non-virtues as well as virtuous actions, non-virtuous actions, they increase, they magnify. So the good news is that also applies to virtuous actions. So of course, um, therefore we can make sure it magnetize, I mean, we can, by engaging in virtuous action, that's the good news. Um, and we can destroy virtuous actions, of course, through negative actions. Through negative actions, it works the same way. If I regret giving someone a lot of money, well, not only is the money gone, but the virtue is gone because I regretted that action. And if then I become really, really stingy, I may totally destroy that karmic imprint. So it works both ways. That's the power of the mind. However, it's important to say these, these four powers, the more intense they are, like real intense rewards. That was not okay. Um, this was, I've really, I've really made a mistake here. And also these actions that I don't remember, I shouldn't have done them. If I could turn time back and I could remember, I wouldn't do them. That kind of really strong remorse and of course resolve, etc. Does that help a little bit? In yes, answer to yes. your question? You okay. Much. All right, great. Then I saw someone just now Raising their Katerina, Katerina, did you raise your? Yeah. Well, I did, but um, yeah, it was it was kind of answered my question just now, okay. but uh, maybe as a follow up on on purification, when you say the twenty one times uh, the Vajrasattva mantra, saying it twenty one times every night, this is what mm -hmm. I do the Vajrasattva purification, mm -hmm. and. Um, but this is only to to purify what happened during this day, like on that day. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I do it as a preliminary practice um, mm -hmm. to purify any more than that, or, or would I have to do more than twenty one times so I would actually um, purify like past karmic mm -hmm. seeds? Well, the purpose is usually, it's usually said, do it 21 times every day because it takes care of those non-virtues you've accumulated throughout the day. Well, depending on, of course, the strength, like, it, it all comes down to how focused are we? How strongly do we feel about any non-virtue? Not just those accumulated throughout the day, but all of them. I mean, if we can make the time, because it's not just done with 21 Taras, I need to, that's again, the power of the mind. I need to put my mind in that direction. I want to pure for everything. Okay, I'm a bit in a, you know, okay, I don't have that much time, but I want to do all of them. I'm going to do all of them with these 20. It's just, again, how you use your mind, how you use your mental consciousness, right? So I think probably you, 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 you do it more than that, you know, as like a, and maybe you can do a little more sometimes if you can. I mean, the more you do it, of course, the more likely it, you, you purify it. But again, I think it's, it's definitely dependent on your mind. Yeah, you can purify more. 
but I can't give you an exact. I mean, no one really, or unless they're clairvoyant, etc. I can't tell you how much you actually, yeah, purify. But it's still good to continue and just do it. You know, my teachers, they always talk about this. When you meditate, there needs to be feeling. I love that. That needs to be, it's not like, okay, 21 power. Okay, 21 vajrasattva. Okay, purification number one. I like it. the remorse done. That's not, that's not going to be effective. There needs to be like something coming from your, from deep within, like deep remorse and not guilt, not guilt. Very different. That's an extreme. No guilt. The other extreme is like, uh, that wasn't too good, but you know what happened. It, it happened. That's the other extreme. No, you need to have deep remorse. Everything needs to come from deep within. And the more your mind is moved, the more effective it becomes. Mm -hmm. And this is true for every meditation. So his holiness has also lately been saying that you need emotion. You need feeling. It's hard to put into word. What is that feeling? But it's like when it comes, to, if, when your whole being is very much, you know, when you meditate on love, you become love, right? When you, when you meditate on remorse, you become remorse, right? Everything is permeated by that particular state of mind. And that's when your meditation becomes really effective and your purification as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I heard once that um, shame would be a feeling that's like not just appropriate, but um, even helpful because it deepens that kind of remorse. Would you say that? Shame. That <laughs> shame. You see, the problem with shame is that it has a really negative connotation in the West. But it is used in Buddhist context because we don't have another word. Right, we run out of words. The Tibetans have so many term terms. I mean, have so many to have so many terms for all the different mental factors. So they chose shame as one of them, but that is very different to shame as we ordinarily think of. Now, a, a lot of a lot of Buddhist study. It's it's interesting because the study of Buddhist philosophy, you know what it's called in Tibetan? It's called the study of definitions. In other words, you you learn terminology, which is that which is defined, the definendum, by way of understanding what does it refer to. So first understanding what does love actually mean in the Buddhist context? What is shame? What is conscientiousness? What is remorse? We use these words and usually bring our personal understanding into our studies. And that needs to be undone first. We need to first learn what does it actually mean in a Buddhist context, right? So shame is a good example. What is shame? How would you define shame in an ordinary, I don't even know. I'm so used to using it in a Buddhist context, and I never use it when I just talk to people. You should be ashamed of yourself. I would never, right? What is shame? Anyone? How would you define shame? Shame. I'm, I'm ashamed. It usually involves another person, doesn't it? It involves another person. Unless you're like shape of yourself, you know, when you're, I don't know, if you have never taken off your clothes and you now take them off and I'm like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. But that's ridiculous, right? So usually it involves another person. Okay, so shame involves another person. Um, feeling bad of something. I don't even know. Does anyone have a definition? I'm sure if you look it up now, you'll find plenty of definitions um, that are all different because it's not easily grasped, right? In Buddhism, so now let's move away from what it ordinarily means. It's negative connotation. It's a sense of uh, feeling uncomfortable having done something negative and feeling uncomfortable with regard to the other person, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that there are two aspects. When I do something negative, let's say I cheated this other person. They're my best friend and they just found out. So first of all, I feel unconscious with regard to myself, right? Just even before, even be and that's a that's a positive actually, a positive state of mind. Let's say before my friend found out that I cheated her, I feel uncomfortable. That wasn't okay. That really wasn't okay. I, I why would why did I do that? I didn't need to do that. You know, you feel bad 
just yourself. That's called conscientiousness. But bad in a good way, not like, oh, I'm falling into a deep depression and need to, you know, be hospitalized. No, no, no. Just a sense that wasn't okay. I don't feel comfortable. It's it's a it's a it's based on reasoning, if you like. It's a it's a very typical Buddhist way to say when an emotion that is usually negative, when it's based on reasoning, it can be helpful. So emotions even such as fear and concern, you know, when they're based on reasoning, they're controlled and they can be ha- helpful. If I'm fearful of my own negative actions, that's a good thing. Or shame, uh, sorry, conscientiousness in this case. I feel bad just with regard to myself. And then the other person finds out. So not only do I feel conscientious about this, I feel bad towards this person. I feel bad like taking this person into consideration, even before they found out. How could I do this to them? They've been so kind to me. Every time I see them, I feel like, oh, you know, like I need to make this right. And when they find out anyway, because now I have to. Con- so that's called shame. That's not something negative. That is. It doesn't go into extremes such as, oh, I can't show my face. No, it's an honest, it's an honest type of mind that is honest with regard to what I've done and also with regard to the other person showing them possibly, um, what's the word, Um, facing up to what I've done wrong. That's a good thing, but it needs to be explained. Shame, okay? It's not what is usually considered to be shame in in western terms right yeah. does that make sense yeah. yeah absolutely yes thank you very much you're welcome <laughs> all right oh i'll see there's some questions in the chat possibly oh yes very good something hidden tremendous guilt hating oneself oh yes 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 um yeah so shame as in like tremendous guilt oh guilt has no place in Buddhism. I mean, really, it has no place. Guilt is like, oh, I'm so bad. Hating oneself, exactly, um, as the person uh, put it here. So hating oneself, like, oh, I'm so terrible. I'm What I've done is so wrong. That's another extreme. You see, in Buddhism, we talk about avoiding extremes. In all our negative emotions, all our afflictions are negative. They are extremes. They have an, a, a balanced kind of version, but they themselves are extreme. Suffering is an extreme experience. Our mind is not meant to suffer, if you like, right? That's why we don't like it. We naturally don't want it. We naturally want to experience a peace of mind. Peace of mind. We want to be calm, etc. So suffering is an extreme result of extreme emotions and so an extreme emotion is guilt yes and there it is uh, oh there the, the yes yeah so it's like something that gives you great suffering i don't know how to translate that right away it's like from christina translated into german but basically yes um it's it's a kind of feeling where you you you're embarrassed kind of like you're you're put out out there you feel like you're you're exposed and it it, you torture yourself with that and that's not what it what is meant here yeah yeah great thank you for the these comments in the chat i'm gonna pay more attention to that all right and then oh there's sk hey yeah hi Yes, you know. uh, yes. Okay. Um, over the years, you know, as uh, you know, I've been practicing in different traditions, uh, you know, uh, there is a, a sense of a disen- uh, disenchantment with sansara, which is coming in. Mm-hmm. But I have, uh, you know, uh, I'm married, I have an extended family and friends. Mm-hmm. So I have just noticed um, that uh, there is a sense of, you know, um, indifference or impatience and sometimes a sense of self-righteousness, which mm-hmm. comes up uh, in me. Mm-hmm. When I see, you know, my family and friends suffering, but, you know, they still uh, are not following the path or not doing any practices. Mm-hmm. So at the back of the mind, there is a wisdom that, yes, maybe the karmic seeds haven't ripened to, you know, be to have an access to dharma. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, there is this sense of, you know, uh, I'm not being fair enough to them being, uh, you know, impatient with them saying, why don't you practice? Mm-hmm. So how, how do I address? There's always this conflict coming mm-hmm. up, but, you know, I'm not being fair to them. 
So how do I address? Though I know patience mm. is one mm. of the parameters I need to work on, one mm. of the perfections. Mm -hmm. uh, but the self righteousness does come up, you know, and saying mm. that oh, you know, oh, I'm kind of higher mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. them, and you know. Mm. So mm -hmm. how do I address yes, yes. that in my daily life? You know, while very I'm important. with my family and friends. Yeah. Yes, very very important. It's just one of those steps, you know, like sometimes. Buddhist practice when we when we start and we're pretty much all of us are beginners right I mean there's some advanced practitioners but most of us are beginners and some of my teachers they talk about first starting starting to practice it's like taking a bicycle and riding through a thick rainforest you know oh there are all these lumps and there are all these bumps and then there are roots sticking out and it like Oh, you just did this meditation on, on love and there you are falling over this, right? And at some point, when you continue, 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 you reach the highway and the ride is much smoother. So it's kind of nice to know <laughs> it's going to get a little easier. But what you describe is a totally natural process. Yes, renunciation, of course, that first step, which of course doesn't mean you give up your family, you give up your, of course you don't do that. It's just reducing attachment to all those, right? It's just, oh, I can't live without this. No, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm happy with it, but I'm I would be happy even without it. So you kind of created this distance, this emotional distance, but in a good way, like just emotional in, ter in terms of attachment is reduced. But very interesting what you mentioned. Yes, a self-righteousness may come in. Come on, you guys, can't you see it? It's so obvious, right? Oh, they ah, I, I know what they're doing, why they suffer. I mean, it's almost like they're running against the wall all the time and they're complaining about a headache. Stop running against the... Oh, I, I totally get that. Now, here, and this is an important point, here you need to replace it with deep love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Love and compassion. First of all, recognize that it's, unique it's unusual that you have found the buddhist path and have been able to use it i mean look of the billions of people in this world who is really putting the dharma into practice i mean can put it into practice it's like it's like if if you have still obstructions certain obstructions and if the mind is not interested if it's too interested in material objects you can't force it that's why Buddhism doesn't, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, you don't have Buddhist missionaries because you can't force someone to become a Buddhist. Of course you can make them bow to the Buddha instead of to, I don't know, I don't know, a Hindu goddess, for instance, but that doesn't mean they're a Buddhist, far from it. So here I'm not talking about all these Buddhists who are cultural Buddhists, go to the temple on a certain day and, you know, and, and pray to Buddha. No, it is when we actually start to put it into practice. That's really what becoming a Buddhist is. Put it into practice, use these methods, apply them to ourselves and make changes. And you describe that very important change of reducing attachment, of generating renunciation. But the others, they can't. It's not like they don't want. If you could give them the, the non-attachment pill, oh, my God, it'll be, <laughs> ah, I don't know, it'll be like one of those famous pills. <laughs> Viagra? Nothing. I mean, it's the, you know, renun renunciation pill or love pill and so forth, like love in the Buddhist context. So, wow, it would be revolutionary. But people can't. You can't force it. It needs to. It's, it's, a, it's a process that, well, in your case, you've you've reached it, but in their case, they haven't. They just can't help it. They don't see it. They don't see how they harm themselves. So therefore, to think, if I were in their position, if I had the same karmic makeup, if you like, and in my case, there's like this little tiny, you know, light that's coming in, but in their case, it's not coming in. If I were in their situation, I would be just like that. Right. If I were in, in the, if I had their mind, their imprints and so forth, for some reason, I'm lucky I have this imprint from whenever and I can see that this doesn't make sense, etc. So compassion. We need to replace it with compassion. I know exactly what you mean. I've gone through exactly the same. 
Oh, all these samsaric people, can't they see? <laughs> right? They dare look down on me because I'm a but right? I had these, but it's this is total it's it's self-destructive. It doesn't help. It's it leads to resentment, it leads to it's worse. It's worse than because it, it eats you up. Any form of resentment eats you up. You can never be calm and peaceful. So it just har harms you. So to replace it, the best way is to put yourself into their shoes and get a sense of how they're stuck, how they're stuck involuntarily. Do they want to suffer? No, but they keep creating the causes of suffering, right? And I can think of my own relatives. It's so clear. Don't do this. Ah, done again. Ah, don't do that. Oh, done again, right? Conflicts with the neighbor. Oh my God, how silly. <laughs> but yeah. In that way, therefore, in short, replace it with love and compassion. Every time you feel this resentment and self-righteousness and all these appear, go, oh, that's my problem, right? Because when self-righteousness and so forth arises, I feel like it's the other person's problem. Oh, they're having, oh, oh, no, 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 no. It's my problem, right? Right? Turn in, oh, I'm having a problem. So mindfulness and introspection, am I self-righteous or am I really understanding and loving? Right? And then apply the antidote. Yeah. Thank you, Geshma. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Okay. Anyone else? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I have a question about uh, taking refuge. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, both on the uh, on theoretical and practical level mm -hmm. uh, so the question is like uh, why is it important since mm -hmm. uh, we can practice and uh, um, we can really live up to the buddhist um, mm -hmm. uh, values without mm -hmm. taking refuge mm -hmm. and uh, second like how one do this like uh, uh, you know uh, in a practical way i mean like if I decide to take refuge, should I uh, go find a teacher with whom I want to take refuge, or is it enough if I if I say it uh, for myself? So mm -hmm. okay, good. <laughs> good. That's an important question. So interesting, because from your question, uh, I understand that you're you're having the sense of taking refuge is like being baptized. And this is how it's used in the West now, right? This is actually in, uh, traditionally, it doesn't exist that way, right? I mean, traditionally, you take refuge. One day you go, oh, yeah, I can take refuge now. And you do it, and that's it. The, the reason there is a ritual now is... Because in the West, we know there are rituals. We, you know, there's a ritual for becoming Christian, to become baptized. There's a ritual to become Jewish. There's a ritual, well, you, traditionally, you know, your mother had to be Jewish. But nowadays, you can actually uh, convert. You can become Jewish. And I, I think it involves some kind of ritual. And so there are a lot of other rituals we're used to, and it helps us. It just helps the mind. And that's why a lot of lamas have introduced it. It just helps. It's helpful. So they've seen, okay, for Westerners, it's it just like, you know, when you get married, you can make the vows to each other and just say, like, come on, let's be faithful until, you know, the day we, we die. Or you find a priest and do this whole ritual. It just helps. Okay. And, of course, you have rituals in Buddhism as well, taking vows, becoming a nun or a monk. There's definitely a ritual. And so in that way, it makes sense. But it's not necessary. First of all, it's not necessary. You don't need to do that. If you like to do it, you can, but you can take refuge right here and right there, right now. But to say something about the importance of this, why, why it's done in the first place and what it actually means. First of all, most important of the three objects is, of course, the Dharma itself, the teachings, right? The teachings themselves. Now, the teachings being most important, the, the rest, as you know, the Buddha, as in like the one who, who, who guides us, and then the Sangha, who those, those who help me. So the Dharma. Now, right now, in, their, in our everyday life, do we take refuge? Of course we do. When you're miserable, when I'm miserable, what do I take refuge in? A bar of chocolate, maybe? 
you know i mean i want to i want to get let me just make sure i see both of you yep i want to i want to uh get rid of this problem i have an issue right now so the, the the way we start is like oh i feel miserable there's something not okay so i want to solve this because our mind is not meant to suffer in the sense that yeah i mean we can utilize suffering for for something positive but the point is in general we don't want it it's a natural response and of course everyone deserves to be free from suffering deserves to be happy and thus, when suffering arises, we try to find a solution. We take refuge in chocolate, in going to a friend and talking to a friend, maybe just, just you know, just, um, just kind of, what's the word, uh, distracting ourselves, watching a movie, all sorts of means and methods to deal with this problem, overcome this problem, or maybe just push it aside. Now, taking refuge is saying, do all that if you, if you if it helps you. But look at the Dharma. Look at the Dharma. Is there a method that helps you to solve this problem, deal with this problem? So taking refuge is really saying, I turn towards the Dharma. I turn towards, on top of, you know, eating chocolate, doing, it's not even saying don't do that. But understand, to really overcome this problem, eating chocolate is not going to do it. Here, the Dharma can offer you some methods where you don't just push it aside, stop thinking about it. You face it head on and work towards overcoming its causes to totally eliminate this problem, right? That's taking refuge. So really taking refuge is more like, and you, 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 why do you recite it? To remember, I have a problem, chocolate. Oh no, Dharma, <laughs> right? We're so used to thinking, I have a problem you know, I don't know, watch a movie. We're used to it. We have a habit of turning towards our friends, etc. So no one needs to remind us and it may help, right? Um, however, we don't have the habit towards to turn towards the Dharma. Now, taking refuge in the form of this prayer, right? I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It's just to remind us, ah, oh, next time, because it leaves something, it leaves something in our mind, leaves a residue. So I have a problem, I recited this prayer three times in the morning. And please don't just, what's important is understand if you recited just the words and you think of chocolate, you're not going to think of the Dharma. So of course, most important is the thought at the time. And then when a problem arises, as I said, ah, what solution does the Buddha, what is the Dharma? What is the Dharma? So really your mind moves in that direction. That's all. That's really all it is. And you don't need to take on any everything. That doesn't make sense. The bits and pieces you find helpful. In that way, you're already taking refuge. So it's not like you have to take refuge. I mean, it's just another label we apply. Oh, I just took refuge. Now I'm a Buddhist. That's not really what it means to be a Buddhist. That's just applying a label. Um, so it's much more that you your mind moves automatically towards finding a solution in the methods offered. And to strengthen that, to strengthen that ability in the moment when everything goes wrong, to actually have the Dharma in your mind, or even when things go right, to have the Dharma in your mind, to, to make the Dharma part of your life, to slowly overcome problems that may potentially arise. You take refuge. So it's not just for a problem. I took the example of the problem. Initially, we only studied the Dharma really when we have a problem right? When things are going well, we kind of forget. But at some point, it becomes part of your life. It becomes part of your. So in every situation, what does the Dharma teach me? Every situation becomes a meditation, becomes a way to apply the Dharma, right? To improve whatever can be improved. And eventually, of course, actualize our fullest potential, become awakened. You see what I'm saying? So really, it's, it's, it's a mental a mental kind of turning towards. But you also take refuge not just in the external Dharma, you take refuge in your future Buddhahood, your future when you start living the Dharma by kind of here taking refuge is not like, please help me, future me, because not gonna, how can the future you help you right now? But it's more like, wow, I, 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 I want to reach that. I want to become that person. So here taking refuge is like, has that aspirational quality. 
I want to become that person. I want to live the Dharma. So I look forward to being this person. I, I aspire. I, I, I wish to quickly become that person who can actually live the Dharma and be an inspiration to others and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Very much. Very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. sorry. Just asking the next question. Oh, yeah, like this. No sorry. Yeah, this is, no problem. Uh, oh, this is probably a very basic question, but uh, I have uh, I have this mental block with the with the very basis of the four noble truths that mm -hmm. I find it hard to accept that. Uh, like I accept that life is suffering and the eightfold path or whatever is the path to the cessation of suffering, but I find it hard to accept that all suffering is bad. Like for mm. me, like. I feel like a little suffering is good. A little attachment is good. And in fact, <laughs> like, I find it hard to accept that enlightenment should be a goal for anyone. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like everybody should be compassionate. It's easier if you have a little suffering to understand like someone else's mm -hmm. suffering maybe. And uh, like, for me, this is a big mental block to a lot of mm -hmm. meditations where uh, like you okay. can be lovingly kind to someone. Mm -hmm. And you can be like anger, angry and understand their anger. But for me, like it's, I don't know, I, I haven't, like it's been a few years that I've been thinking about this, that I just can't get over this, that uh, like I can't make myself accept that all suffering is bad and just having a little craving, having a little aversion is not always a bad thing. Mm, and what, good. I don't okay, know what, how I should phrase this, what can I do about this or... Should I accept that this lifetime, this is how I'll be, and maybe? <laughs> well, you can accept, of course, but <laughs> well, maybe there is another way to look at it because it makes total sense what you say. It makes one hundred percent sense. The thing is this: first of all, when it comes to suffering, you're right. Suffering can be useful. I totally agree with you. How can I have compassion? Uh, for someone, as you said, without understanding what they're going through. Totally. So I think what's important is to look at where we are right now. We're beginners, right? We are beginners. We experience suffering. But what, what, what do we usually do with it? We push it away, right? That's our direction. <gasps> no, I can't. Oh, and chocolate, 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 whatever, right? Um, so we don't want to. So here, as a, as a, as a at the, at the beginning of the path in particular, we shouldn't push it away. We should embrace it and turn it into the path of to liberation, into a spiritual thing. So it's actually utilized. There are certain texts in, called lojong or mind training texts. And really, every Buddhist practice is mind training. So it's really not that you have mind training here and Buddhist practice over there. No, actually... Um, there's a genre of, of texts that are called mind training texts, but really all Buddhist practice is mind training. So it's just kind of puts it together. These texts just emphasize it a little bit more, but all of us should act in that way. So every suffering should be used and it has many positive aspects. It has many positive. So to utilize it, that is one part in terms of suffering. Then there are the afflictions, attachment and aversion. Now, aversion, it is difficult to say uh, that it's beneficial. It's, 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 the, the thing is, um, it's okay to have it. I mean, let's not be too hard on ourselves. I mean, I'm just in the beginning. I cannot have any aversion. That's not what Buddhism was all about. It's not like, stop aversion right away. That's like saying, stop sweating. You know, walk into, spend a summer in Delhi, but do not sweat, <laughs> right? Impossible. Um, so that, therefore, it's important to understand that we have our afflictions. It's a, we have them. And the thing is that they're harmful. Actually, they harm us. They make us feel miserable. And when we allow them to run wild, they're more likely to grow stronger. So at least to restrain them, make sure they don't grow bigger. 
And in the beginning, yeah, I mean, attachment is the last thing I get rid of. And I have to be really highly advanced to totally overcome it, right? So to understand that, that this will be with me for a while, but to control it. Because if it controls me, I'm in trouble. I'm going to have this experience that I don't want, suffering. And I, if I have a little bit, that's okay, but I don't want to be overwhelmed by it, right? And in that way, it's a slow process of accepting suffering, right? And utilizing it as much as we can. But wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? We reached a state without suffering, having incredible love and compassion automatically. Just think, without any problems, without any affliction. And from a Buddhist point of view, we have the potential to reach that. Because our mind is actually not in the nature of suffering. It's not in the nature of afflictions. We have a mind that in its nature is able to be loving and compassionate. Limitlessly, anyone, we have the, we have the ability to be loving and, 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 and compassionate towards all sentient beings, towards anyone we meet. So if we can reach that state, we can actually, we can reach that state. It's not that difficult. We have everything we need for that. And... Keeping, keeping our afflictions and keeping our suffering in a controlled way is good. But do I know I'm always going to control them? Well, therefore, isn't it safer to work towards that state, but accept suffering and uh, attachment and so forth when it's there? To live with it and not to repress it, not to oppress, like not to to wish it away and 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 push it away in such a way that it comes out stronger, right? So start where you are. It's very important as part of Buddhist practice to accept who you are, right? That's the part of self-love, for instance. And if you want to generate more love and compassion, and initially that's totally fake. We have love and compassion for certain people, but for anyone, no, it's fake, right? But we're trying to work with it. Well, we need to start loving ourselves, accepting who we are, accepting our suffering, accepting our negative aspects and understanding there's room for improvement. Yeah. So it's not about becoming a Buddhist Buddha right away. No, understand we're just practitioners and we'll do what we can to reduce aversion, right? Control it first, keep it in. But if I avert, I mean, if I had just a boast of like getting angry, okay, all right, okay. Okay, remorse is good. All right, that was not good. Not guilt, but ah, bummer. Shouldn't have done that. All right, learned my lesson. Hopefully, next time I do it. You see what I'm saying? So in that way, you work towards... It's a bit like saying, I could be totally healthy. I could be totally healthy. I have a body that has the potential to be totally healthy, do all these incredible movements, you know, dance a ballet, be a yoga expert, be a weight, lift all these weights. I have all this ability. But right now, yeah, I can't do it right now. That's okay. I have these aches and stuff, but I'm working towards it. So I'm accepting my body as it is, but I know I can do more and I slowly work towards it in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the body, the healthy body analogy makes sense. Yeah, yeah. use the body example because it's the same kind of principle if that helps with the body. Yes, right now I have aches and stuff and I accept them and I can learn from these aches to get better. I can use them to overcome the causes, but eventually I want to get better. So mm. that's the same with the mind. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, let me check the chats. There's something in the chat. Uh, someone asked about the June Tushita topic. I'll talk about this after this uh, after this session. I'll talk about the this June course someone mentioned in the chat. Kritika mentioned. All right. Any questions? Any questions other than that? Um, I wanted to ask about the mm -hmm. the. Sonata. The three stages of learning about the study, contemplation, and meditation. Mm -hmm. And the question that I have is, um, let's say, for example, we are focusing on a particular sutra, mm -hmm. and we have, we've studied it, and we have some understanding about it. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then probably there is action based on that understanding. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say that's one stage. And then mm-hmm. at another stage, we have contemplated on it. We have some understanding on the same sutra and we've taken mm-hmm. some action based on that contemplation on the okay. same sutra. Let's, let's mm-hmm. see. And yeah. then let's say there's a third stage where we've meditated on the sutra and we've understood something about the sutra and we've taken an action based on that Mm -hmm. meditation process Mm -hmm. Um, so my question here is in this scenario of these three stages Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that our understanding and our actions at each of these three stages of the same sutra will be different Mm -hmm. and so my question on that is how do I reconcile if my understanding and action at the meditative stage is different as compared to my understanding and action at the at the study stage Mm -hmm. because sometimes I feel a conflict within me when my understanding at a different stage is different than my previous stage different in a good way or different in a negative way well that's interesting good point I feel they are different so my feeling on that is now I feel different than I felt before. So what what happened before in my study stage is that was that right? So I begin to question mm. my understanding and action at the study stage of the sutra as compared to a different stage. Okay. All right. That's an important question. Well, all of your questions are important, but uh, yeah, it's um, with regard to these three stages of study or listening as it's literally uh, translated usually, Uh, contemplation or reflection and meditation all right so now the question is basically are we doing it right if at the end if I've meditated on something and my thoughts are quite different to when I when I when I reach that state of just studying about it am I going in the right direction I guess that's really what it boils down to right Okay, so let me just give you an example. On the basis of examples, I think it always works best. Really, the example I would give you is when you learn about impermanence. Okay, learning about impermanence. Now, there are different levels of impermanence. The first level, let's take the coarser level of impermanence. Not the subtle change all the time. That's a little harder to 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 understand. So the fact that our life may end any time, all right, that we may die any time. Now, first we learn about this. It seems funny that we need to learn about it because actually this is something we we should know, but we need to be reminded every now and then, right? So the thing is we learn about this. There are all these causes uh, why we could die and no one has lived beyond the age of, I don't know, definitely 150 um, so in that way, basically, it's a reminder or, or some people may not actually know one day they die. Who knows where, where, where they come from? So they may have not been taught that. The point is like we learn about this and we talk about the wisdom arising from learning. That is actually, mm, I mean, it may affect our actions to a certain degree, but let's not be too optimistic because it won't affect our actions to a great degree right I mean they'll be like oh okay interesting yeah this kind of "Mm, I may die anytime okay all right Mm, need to remember that kind of thing so definitely there's that thought but it doesn't go very deep right it's just an understanding it's an intellectual understanding and then I start reflecting on it I mean the thing is like I hear it that's I hear it, I have some rough sense. Now I need to go into detail. So what does that exactly mean? Okay, Um, in terms of all the different aspects of death, I could die tomorrow, I could die by accident, I could die by all the different causes of death. I kind of reflect on them more, like to, to a better degree, to get a better understanding. It goes deeper. Okay, so it goes deeper in that, I, I remove any kind of doubt. Okay, I'm affected by that. Anyone is affected by that, etc. But then meditation, that is really where we internalize it. This is me. You bring yourself in. I mean, if you can bring yourself in earlier, great. But just to remove all doubts, that may not be necessary. But I, I myself, I could die anytime. Oh my God, this could be my last day. Um, 
there's a 50% chance I'm dead tomorrow, right? It's it's kind of like 50-50. I could be, gosh, I could be dead tomorrow. Um, and I just set off to have a fight with my with my sister, you know, who's been annoying me. I'm going to tell her off. But if I knew I was going to die, I would never do that, right? I, I would not act in that way. So I would make preparation in in a, in a very profound way. I mean, everything would be different if I knew I'm going to die tomorrow. And just knowing there's a 50% chance my day-to-day is lived in a very different way. My worries, very different. So you see, the effect on my personal life is very different. But I see a sequence here. I don't see any contradiction. In the first place, it was like, hmm, interesting. Ah, okay. Impermanence. Hmm, yeah, I got some new ideas. I should know this. It kind of makes sense. But okay, I've never seen it this way. So it's kind of like just this, how, how interesting, that aspect, how interesting. The second aspect, it's like, okay, I've, got, I've gone into all the details. I have no doubt about it. Initially, I may still have some doubts. How does this apply to this person or that situation, etc.? But in the second stage, I have no doubt. In the third stage, I moved on an emotional basis. In, on a deep emotional state, I'm feeling, yes. Oh my God, how, what am I doing with my life? I'm really living my life as if I'm going to live forever, right? Usually we have already reached the first stage. Yeah, I can die anytime. We know that. But we live as if we are immortal. Then during the second state, there is already some certain things I may not be doing any longer. The third stage after meditation, it's like it's always on my mind. But it doesn't have to be always on my mind to the degree as like I've internalized it. I don't need to think about it. I'm acting out of this understanding. I have a deep understanding. I could die any time and I live my life with this in mind, although I'm not, I don't have to think about it all the time. I've internalized it. And on an emotional level, it affects me in such a way that I no longer waste time. You see what I'm saying? So it's a gradual process where it goes deeper and deeper. And when I say deeper, I'm saying it affects me on an emotional level. It's not just intellectual. The first two are much more intellectual, right? The second is it goes deeper, yes? A deeper understanding, free from doubt, etc. But the third one is like, wow, it's in my life. So to take the sutra, let's take the sutra. First, you learn about the sutra, okay? In the second state, you start learning and like, remove all doubts and see what is it that is it is there something that affects my own personal life? Because death affects everyone. I mean, death is something everyone can internalize. But there are certain parts of a sutra where we also have to learn because it, it contains a lot. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes it teaches about permanence, it teaches about suffering, it teaches about love, it teaches about it's like a it's like a whole. I mean, it teaches about the five paths, like the Heart Sutra, for instance, and emptiness. So here I need to, with my reflection, also check which part of this is relevant to me at this point. Which one do I take first? Which one can I apply to my own life? And start finding the bits that are relevant and apply them to my own life. And then in your meditation, it's that internalization. You take it in, you take it in all the way. And you may just choose one topic first because you can't do it all together. Take a particular aspect that speaks to you most at your, at your situation right now in, you know, and that may just be today, actually, the way your day runs, the way things are, etc. for you right now. Right now in the sutra, the fact that we should be mindful really speaks to you. So you understand mindfulness as it's explained, you get a better sense how you can apply it in your daily life, and then you apply it. I'm mindful the whole day. I practice it. I'm mindful. So, and and, and you can make you may go on with this practice for a few months, and then you make, take the ne- same the next aspect and internalize that without forgetting mindfulness. And so, in that way, you internalize all of them. You integrate them. You make them part of your life, so that. You're not controlled by your afflictions, but you're controlled by these positive states of mind by way of controlling them yourself. You see what I'm saying? So so I'm just reflecting back. uh, What Mm -hmm. I've heard is that the positive direction of all of these stages basically leads us into a deeper 
interiorization of the qualities and application of them in our day-to-day life. Exactly. Exactly. That's the whole point. It's not, it's, we only have studied them. We only reflect on them with this last goal to help them Mm. transform our mind because these are all methods to reducing suffering, to reducing these unwanted experiences that our mind is not supposed to have. I mean, we can learn from them as long as we have them, but in the end, to find real peace and to find to be to have the space of mind also to not be preoccupied with our suffering, to be of greatest benefit to others. We need a mind that is totally free from suffering, etc. And in that way, we can focus on others. So therefore, yes, exactly what you said, to internalize them, to make them part of our life, to live them, and in that way, to remove afflictions. Right? That's really the main goal. Yeah. yeah thank you. You're welcome. And I saw something in the chat that just popped up quickly. All right. So someone asked, how do you differentiate between the personal experience of studying or listening stage, reflecting stage, and eventually meditation stage? Take on example of emptiness or subtle interdependence and elaborate precisely. (laughs) Okay. I'll try to do that. Um, Okay. So how do you differentiate? So this is, if you want to follow the question, it's in your chat. Uh, it says chat, and there you have the question. How do you differentiate between the personal experience of studying or listening stage, reflecting stage? That's actually really important to make it personal if you can, right? Some people can and some can't. And I think it's a matter of habit that You bring in the personal, even in the beginning, like as you learn about something, always in the back of your mind, how is this relevant to me? How is this relevant to me? It's almost like you open your heart. It's very difficult to put it into words because it's it's good. Yeah, it's, it's so it's so hazy, really. But it's almost like even when you listen to a teaching, let's say by His Holiness, and there's a lot of new information, things that you've never heard before. So you have that intellectual part of your mind working. But at the same time, you apply it to yourself as well. Oh, so this could be a, this could be something as homeless is saying something there that could help me in this problem or in that situation. So it's almost like you have your own mind right in front of you. It's almost like you're with your, and for that, of course, you need in general a lot of mindfulness, a lot of introspection, so that you're very much aware weaknesses, strength, and so forth. That's that preparatory part needs to be. So you need to make that preparation. And so then um, how do you differentiate? So in what way, how can I differentiate between that and not personalizing it? Well, if I don't really know so much about my own mind, if I don't know so much about my weaknesses and strength and which of, how much aversion do I have? So it's a, it's a lot about um either having mindfulness and introspection or not. If you don't have it, then it's it's more like an external thing. First, like what is anger? It's like you may even analyze your, your neighbor's anger versus your own when you learn about anger, right? It's outside of yourself. It's like, oh, anger, like this abstract thing. It works like this. This is it arises as a result of exaggerating the negative aspect of the other person. Um, so let's take anger is a good example. We learn about anger. Anger is a mind that perceives the other person, in the case of getting angry, perceives the other person as intrinsically another being. Intrinsically, there's this inherent I in them. And now they're doing something negative, which is in and of itself, there's a sense it's independently bad it's got nothing to do with my view on things no there's this badness uh, of this person and this bad action that they performed and this person become one and that in, in particular because this negative aspect I blow it up before I get angry even before I get angry it goes really quickly but it needs to be explained so this negative action of that person, this person becomes one. I, I blow it up. They can only see that negative action. No longer anything positive about that person. All I can see is this negative action, and this person is one with this negative action. It's a, this short moment before aversion that I have that sense, and then I, I, I resent this person for them. I have aversion towards them. And the stronger this aversion, the stronger, the, the more it may lead to the thought to actually harm them. 
but at the very least, I just want to get away from them. So that's how anger works. And if someone explains it to me, I may have that sense of like when I first learn, there's anger over there. And I, I, I reflect on, I, I learn about that. And then I reflect on it. I try to understand it better. And then I personalize it. But if I can personalize it right from the beginning, I'm not looking at the anger outside of myself like some solid anger. I'm looking at my own anger. I'm taking right away an example of when I got angry with this person and I'm recognizing it. Oh, yeah, I exaggerated. I don't know. Let's say Tom. It was Tom. So Tom's Tom in that moment, I couldn't see him. So in my mind right away, I'm bringing in the reflective aspect, but I'm personalizing. And in a way, it becomes like almost like a meditation because I'm internalizing it then. So that is like a more advanced stage where I personal take the personal experience, I apply the personal experience of study and listening. And actually, I'm bringing the three, these three stages closer together. And meditation the more advanced you are, well, you, for the meditation, you also need a very deep state of concentration and uh, insight. So there's certain levels of, of meditation as well. It's not just this mere reflection and internalization, but certain qualities you need to develop as well. So really these three stages, you have a beginner stage, you have an intermediate stage, you have an advanced stage. So just roughly sp uh, speaking. So I hope I made this a little bit clearer. So to differentiate between the personal experience of studying um, and so forth. So the, the opposite of personal is just it's over there. And only during the last stage, the meditation when done right, it becomes something personal versus right from the beginning, listening it to it after good self-knowledge or a relative good self-knowledge due to mindfulness and, and introspection that I applied in the way I just described. Take an example of emptiness. Ah, I was supposed to do emptiness. Okay. All right. So take emptiness. It's much more difficult. So here, how am I going to do it with emptiness and interdependence? Well, the I. <laughs> Most beneficial because I'm thinking of myself all the time. So it's pretty easy. <laughs> to just take the eye. Everything revolves about me all the time. So take the eye. So the Lama teaches me there's no inherent eye. So instead of having that abstract sense of an eye over there, I'm using my own self. I'm using my own, that is merely labeled. My sense of I, who am I, right? Who am I? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman. Well, it's merely labeled. It's it's just labeled on the basis of my physical constitution and what else? My 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 thoughts, my preferences. You know, I feel like a woman. So labeled on the basis of that, I label woman. I can't find any womanness. Um, I'm a cousin. Well, again, that's labeled on the basis of the daughter of my aunt. I can't find some cousinness. Uh, I may be a mother. Well, I'm just labeled on the basis of a child I have, right? There's no motherness. Uh, labeled, of course, also on certain thoughts and certain, but all nothing of these are motherness. So in that sense, I can apply whatever I learn about emptiness, either in an abstract way over there or in a in a, in a way that I apply it right here and there right here now, like I hear the Lama speaking, I hear Sonus talking, and it's me in that situation. So first, I'm just learning about it. I'm applying this, then I take it deeper. The teachings are over. Um, and so now I'm taking it to a deeper level, I'm taking it to the level of reflection, and eventually meditation to an even deeper level. Yeah, so I hope I answered this question. Sorry, I, I didn't have to talk about aversion to explain all this. I could have taken emptiness and interdependence right away. But I hope that makes it a little bit clearer how we can differentiate between these two stages, taking it over there, outside of myself, or applying it to myself right away. All right. Okay. How are, how are we with time? Um how long, how long is the session? One and a half hours, Kishila. One and a half hours. Okay, so is this was already an hour? 
10 and minutes? Another 11 minutes, and we have still two hands up. Oh, yeah, Three please go up. ahead. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I took too much time. All right, please raise your hand. Oh, no, I mean, start talking because I don't see the hands. I s oh, yes. Uh, it's Katerina again. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Um, yeah, it's another um, purification um, question. And um, from what I've understood so far, all negative karmic seeds are purified when we realize emptiness. This is no. No. Oh, unfortunately, ah. no. <laughs> okay. No. This is, uh, probably <laughs> my whole question. Yeah, okay, then. Um, so when, yeah. That's well, okay. That's well, question. realizing emptiness conceptually. I mean, if you realize that emptiness conceptually, intellectually, you don't purify the negativities. So you purify negativities. Well, first you need to realize it directly. Realize it directly. Um, but then you only purify the negative imprints that throw you into a lower realm. So all the negativities. So the, the negative throwing karma the karma that throws you into a low realm that is no longer yeah well yeah you would say it's purified it's it's no yeah it's no longer an issue but you still experience you still have completing karma negative ones that may ripen which is why once you realize emptiness directly when you reach what's called the path of seeing you need to move on to the path of meditation and so forth to use this mind that realizes emptiness directly as the most powerful purification tool. Now, you see, it's like it becomes stronger and stronger, even, even though the realization of emptiness is the same, but it becomes stronger in its ability to remove aspects such as negative karmic imprints, afflictions, and so forth, right? So it's not an instantaneous um instantaneous progress pro process it's a bit like think of a vacuum cleaner right your the mind realizing emptiness is like a vacuum cleaner and you slowly turn on the volume like it becomes stronger and stronger you know you have these different stages first level you know certain things are sucked in okay so they're gone and then you turn it up and then more is sucked in and then you turn it further on and then it's totally clean so it's a bit like that in my realizing emptiness. It's just like a great vacuum cleaner that you, you know, as due to your familiarity with that mind and due to, well, in the case of the Mahayana path, compassion and love, they strengthen that mind as well. They strengthen it, make it stronger. And then it's able to suck in more. That is, it, it's able to remove more, right? So it's not an instantaneous, to answer your question, it's not instantaneous. You realize emptiness and it's all gone. Unfortunately not, but it's not much. It, it gets pretty quick in comparison to everything else before. So, of course, it takes time, but with the right methods, and even and in particular when you use the tantric path, you can do it in one lifetime, actually. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is I, um, yeah. So, yeah, maybe just to to have a... It's not a follow-up. My, my initial question was, if, um, like you said, the um, it's a question of degree, and finally we realize emptiness um, spontaneously, and like you just said. But I, I was wondering, if I do Vajrasattva purification, for example, and uh, like we said before, uh, the stronger the emotion, the strong, like the stronger the regret and remorse, the stronger the purification. It feels like I'm doing this on a more, let's say, emotional level. The purification functions on an emotional level, whereas realizing emptiness to me seems more like a technical approach. So um, in some yes. ways, I'm reflecting. So it feels mm -hmm. like two different ways um, or like I'm doing something emotional to reach a result which is actually reached on a diff uh, on a technical yeah, i understand what you mean initially oh. yes yes you're right you're right initially when it comes to purification or any other practice it's much more intellectual and so is emptiness but even emptiness moves beyond that pure intellectual right emptiness is more difficult to understand which is why you can't mo easily move beyond that 
Love and compassion are not that difficult to understand. Uh, purification practices, remorse, they're not that difficult. So we can move from a more intellectual level much faster to that level. But even emptiness, it's like, how can I put it? I, I'm just saying, I'm reading this. So if I kind of pretend now, I'm just pretending now, but it's like, wow, it's like it hits you, right? There's no self. That's how they say it. So it's like, it can't be found. Oh my God. So it really moves you on a very profound level. Nothing is the same. Once you realize emptiness, you like when you realize emptiness, just conceptually, right? You arise from that mind, from that meditative session, and nothing is the same as before. You deeply move from within. You've got all your time on your hand because you don't need to look up to the self all the time. You don't need to self-gratify all the time. Things are different. So there's this emotional. So now I'm kind of in order to express this. No one, they, I mean, a, a practitioner may not actually act the way I do with all this emotion kind of on their face, but it does move them deep within. So it, everything you do, it needs to be brought onto that emotional level. And I'm not saying negative emotion, emotional level. No, on that kind of like, you know, it's like this forceful, this inner strength. It gives you this inner energy for lack of a better word. It, it, it just moves you in such a way. So we use the word emotional here, uh, but it's very difficult to define it really. All I'm saying is, is that it deeply moves you from deep within your mind and affects your actions, therefore, in a very profound way. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Yes. Thank right. you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, uh, Geshima, sorry, a quick question. I see Sonal is also, so I didn't want to be the another person uh, giving more, yeah. asking more questions. But a quick uh, uh, practical question. Uh, you know, over the years, I've been practicing through, of course, retreats on bodhicitta and emptiness in my practice. But now I suddenly, within my Sangha members, see this uh, tremendous, uh, you know, kind of, a, uh, you know, ideology that uh, till you get into Mahamudra and Dzogchen, you haven't arrived and, you know, you're like not on the path. And so there's a lot of confusion uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, you know, is my practice of, you know, uh, reading the suttas, meditating, you know, I follow different traditions from Goenkajis and the Mayana practices. So there is this thing that if you don't do Mahamudra or Dzogchen, if you're not gone, so is that so critical in the path or I'm okay mm -hmm. what I'm practicing as of this moment? All right. Well, you see, there's a title of a book, which is a really good title. The book is good as well, I think. I haven't read it. But the title is Start Where You Are. And that is really, I, I think that should be a mantra for us. Start where we are. So to be, again, with mindfulness and introspection, we are our best witness, in other words. You know, there, there's a text that says, like, of the witness, other people and yourself, yourself, the seven-point mind turning. It says, you're your best witness. So we should learn to become our best witness. Where are we right now? What does it mean to be a Dzogchen practitioner, a Mahamudra practitioner? What are the basic qualities I need to have? And do I have them? All right. So in my case, I can say, no, nope. okay, I, I think amazing Dzogchen Mahamudra. I want to practice them. But since there are many lives to come, and I don't need to pack everything in this lifetime. And if I have the sense I have to pack it into this lifetime, am I not really understanding that there are future lives? Am I having this sense that I'm not even aware of there's just this life, so I have to do it now because I won't do it? So anyway, understanding there's a time for it and I'm not ready for it. But also when it gets really confusing with everything that is offered, listen to the teachings of a great master like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I mean, you're totally safe with someone like his holiness and their other masters as well of course many great masters similar using his holiness as an example there is a person who tells you for instance most important are bodhicitta and emptiness so everything you do somehow it should be connected to bodhicitta and emptiness which it is you know all these practices depending on your motivation directly or indirectly if you're always having those two as the main practice in mind you're safe you're pretty safe. And then as you continue practicing in this way, well, if Mahamudra, if you're not seeking out Mahamudra, Mahamudra will knock on your door, right? When you're ready. I mean, you know what I mean? Someone will somehow, it, it'll, it, you know, you, it's not like you're going to be ready for Mahamudra and you just somehow miss the train of Mahamudra. No, it's not going to happen. Yeah. 
Thank right. you. Thank you, Gish. You're welcome. All right. Let me see. One more question. We have time for one more question. Uh, Elish Shiva. I could see her hand. I, I, don't, I don't see everyone. I have this weird Sorry, thing going on. Can you on. hear me? Oh, yes, there's someone else. Okay. Well, Hi. Yes. Sonal. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm very new to Tibetan Buddhism, so I, maybe my question is awkward. I've okay. had a relatively stable meditation and inquiry practice, okay. and I got into it through hard suffering. So everything is kind of has a target focus like this area. Mm -hmm. um, I have been working on anxiety in a way that um, I get overwhelmed, not just by my own, but somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And a few months back, my teacher was practicing metta, but actually it was the Tonglen technique. Mm -hmm. When they ask you to kind of breathe it all in. And mm -hmm. I do practice or sit with metta with a few people, but visually or Physically, I hold it outside me. Like, I won't take it all in. Like, there's a mm -hmm. space for it to transmute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I talked to him about it. He said, continue with that. And um, the other day, there is a lady who visits our home often. And she was going through something. And I can directly relate to it. Mm -hmm. And um, when I heard it, even though I don't talk about it, and it's kind of automatic, like, the breathing is just, and I can see it not as though I'm helping her, but the feeling is that even though it started with, I breathe it all in, but actually it was my own. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. because I don't know what's happening with her at all. Mm -hmm. So actually there's a huge relief in terms of anger and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I can sit with this easily for hours outside mm -hmm. of the incident. But mm -hmm. when I'm in the middle of it, um, even though I know it's happening, I have mm -hmm. the awareness. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, for instance, if I'm very angry, I can't make eye contact. And, you know, they say, like, it's good to make eye contact and at least show that you're listening because I am listening. That's why I'm angry. Mm -hmm. But I become mm -hmm. so angry that I cannot even make eye contact. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, like what you just said, that when you are ready, the technique comes. And that's how I got you know, Tonglen, because I've been working with this for so long and mm -hmm. it's so good on the meditation side. And in a live environment, there is, you know, I hit the glass ceiling and after mm -hmm. that, it's like something is going to come and I, I know what it is, but I cannot stop it. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. was wondering if you recommend or suggest anything or do you think it's just, you know, because they say bring awareness to it. Should I just stay with bringing awareness to, you know, the body sensation? Because when I'm angry, it's hot. If mm -hmm. I'm anxious, it's cold. So should I just stay with it? Or is there something I can do to kind of take the edge off? Okay. So yeah. with these emotions that in this moment are so overwhelming, the way you describe it. Now, usually... um to of course to watch the physical aspect that's definitely something you could do if that helps you but maybe what you could do is uh, move your attention from the object of the aversion because usually we see, we're angry with someone or yeah. we have aversion yeah. towards someone yeah. move it towards the aversion itself not push it away just go ah interesting there's aversion mm -hmm. Oh, let me watch you. We can do that, right? We can talk to someone and actually think of, I have to put up my laundry or something. We can really much multifunction. Yeah. So you can actually, in that moment, you can actually, in a certain moment, um, take take your attention towards the aversion itself. Usually it yeah. disappears then, right? Yeah. To yeah. use your own, like if someone asked the question, why do I need to get rid of a, attachment and anger and so forth? Couldn't I? Yeah. That was a good question. Yeah. So. We have them still. Let's use them for our own good to learn yeah. from them, right? So when they're there or later on, if we if we can't do it in that moment, later on go back to it and 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 live be with it and get to know it, right? Just go back in time. Um, so oh, that's interesting. Ah, this is how it worked. Where did it come from? How did I feel in that moment? Did I feel good? Was I calm? Was I not? Right? How did I see this other person? Did they appear as like a hundred percent bad? 
what about if in that moment I would have remembered they saved my life one day or something, right? I mean, even if they didn't, what happens to my anger? So really you get to know them better because right now they control us. But in order to not control this, we need to get to know them. It's like an enemy that controls you. You get to know the enemy, you can do something about them, right? So here, and for, for, unfortunately, it's not like a violent act because like a virgin is not a person. You need to know you can get to know it in order to reduce it and control it, right? And that's all it is to gain control over something that right now we have no control over. And therefore, we have no control over all the suffering it, it brings us. But we have to face it head on with a little bit of a distance. You're not your anger. You're not your this. You're not your that. That's why we say my anger, in, in, implying there's a, a being and an anger, right? So not to identify with it, but to get to know it with a sense of embracing it without allowing it to run wild and a sense of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. So that is so important. And let me just finish with that. The self-acceptance, this, this, this calmness and self-acceptance and curiosity, instead of pushing away and try to recognize your own aversion. We, we, we very quickly generate aversion towards ourselves. That's the thing to look out for. It's, I could, you could argue more destructive towards yourself than towards others because yeah, you're more likely to have aversion towards others if you have it towards yourself. So this we need to work out. We need to look out for. So sorry to quick, speak so quickly because I cannot see everyone um, which is why I probably couldn't answer everyone's questions. Elisheva, I know you raised your hand. If you're not still here, let's do it tomorrow. Uh, if you're there yes. tomorrow. Time is over. It's okay. Thank you very much. So we'll do it tomorrow, Elisheva, right? We have a class anyway tomorrow. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to say at the very end to finish the session with, because I've also been asked uh, to talk about this. Well, I'll teach a course uh, in June on the uh, two truths. I just happened to um, prepare some material uh, on that uh, just now for another course. And so I decided to teach the same subject in June. It's like, I think, a 10-day course at Tushita. So uh, Vannevar Kumpin asked me to say that. Or to, yeah, to speak about it. Someone else also asked in the chat. All right. So I guess I have everything. Um, so thank you very much for all your questions. They're so precious. Uh, I learned so much from your questions uh, and we can learn from each other, of course, in that way. That's similar to the way we studied. We learn from each other. And so, yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. But I want to take a moment now to dedicate the positive potential we accumulated together. So let's just take a moment to transform whatever positive potential in such a way that we use the mind, we use our own mind to transform it in such a way that we think, may this become a cause for all of us to be able to remove all afflictions and all unwanted experiences so that we're able to actualize our fullest potential, the fullest potential of our mind that is characterized by love, compassion, wisdom, and so forth. Not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you very much. Have a great day and take care. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Keshila. Thank you so much. And we are very much looking forward to having you back here in Dharamshala very, very soon. And until then, Happy New Year and all the best for you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for joining. Thank Bye. you, everybody. And today we have another guest teacher because it's Sunday and people 
traditionally have a little bit more time maybe. So Vanova Tupton children going to give her second talk on how to uh, create harmony, since this is one of the main causes of keeping our precious teachers and uh, probably a main cause of uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche coming back to us very, very soon in bodily form. So join us nine o'clock Indian time, uh, whatever that relates to in your time zone. Until then, have a good morning, good afternoon, uh, Geshe-la, uh, have a good lunch <laughs> and <laughs> a good evening wherever you are. Thank you so much.